Hi, and welcome back to Long Dog Book Reviews. I'm Shelby, and this is Kiwi. Today we're going to be discussing a short story rather than a novel, and that is 1408 from Stephen King's 2002 anthology Everything's Eventual. This movie was made into a film adaptation in 2007, directed by Mikhail... <laughs> That's a big yawn. Directed by Mikhail Hellstrom and starring John Cusack. This is probably one of my favorite horror movies of all time, uh, despite the fact that it doesn't have a lot of graphic content, but it's extremely psychologically thrilling, and I just really enjoyed it every single time I've seen it. And today we're going to have my husband on the show. Again. Hello. <laughs> so it was my third time watching it, and I think it was your second or third? It's like my third or fourth, yeah. Okay. It follows the story of Mike Enslin, a horror writer who visits hotels and debunks their ghost stories. He has been writing these horror stories for a long time, or anti-horror stories, I guess. And he receives an anonymous postcard telling him not to stay in room 1408 at the Dolphin Hotel. It's also worth mentioning that this story is set in New York. And in contrast, the short story shows him right away talking with the hotel manager, who in the story is a short British guy, and in the movie is Samuel L. Jackson. He plays the character very well, and he plays a different version of the character than we see in the short story, but... Um, it spawned a whole lot of theories, you know, some people say he's the devil, some people say he's just a, an evil hotel manager, and some people say that he planned for Enslin to do what he does all along. Well done, Mr. Enslin. Well done. Uh, I thought it packs a lot in each frame and doesn't waste any time, and um, gets a lot done within a... Um, a short amount of time for the audience. It's only like an hour and forty minute movie or something like that. Yeah, it's but, pretty short. But it's um, but it's really good. Um, I like all the the playful ideas that the director has to to bring the audience around, and uh, I like that there are wake up calls uh, throughout the movie as well that keeps the audience on their toes. Mm -hmm. it doesn't just take one concept and drag it. it evolves essentially yeah and i think it plays with the idea of a haunted hotel room very well because instead of including just a series of ghosts and a bunch of supernatural elements this room torments people with their own past by making them relive their most painful memories and then some in the movie and this happens in the book as well but it's a lot more dramatic in the movie uh samuel L. jackson olin tries to bribe mike with a very expensive bottle of scotch, uh, saying you can check into this other hotel room that has the exact same layout, we can go in and see the room, if, even if you don't stay there. And he tells them about all the deaths that have taken place. Well, grievously in its 95 year existence, the hotel has seen seven jumpers, four overdoses, five hangings, three, three mutilations. mutilations. Two stranglings, General Manager Gerald Olin is well versed in the hotel's tragic history, dryly reciting the docket of carnage like a bookkeeper discussing his ledger. Well. You think you're clever, don't you? I know the game. So during his time in the room, he describes what's going on, and then the first strange thing that happens is the radio going off. <laughs> now, I grew up with parents who listened to the Carpenters, so I was already familiar with this song, and I thought it was a really funny choice, but it makes sense when you think about what's about to happen. A lot of humor in the movie, which I really liked. I think John Cusick played this character very well. Yeah, I think if you would have chosen someone like Nicolas Cage, they wouldn't have been able to um, pull off the humor so slightly. Um, I, I think that's like a one uh, standout in this movie is uh, Enzlin is is very dry but witty, and mm -hmm. it just it, he, but he's like slick and he's cool, and so. He kind of um, he kind of rides that line um, throughout the entire movie. Uh, but seriously, Mike, if I want to see a real life ghost, um, where's my best bet? Guaranteed. Yeah. Haunted Mansion, Orlando. Awesome. Thanks. Stay scared. Yeah. And the movie reflects that as well. It mm -hmm. reflects humor. As well. When I saw it for the first time, I thought it was Nicolas Cage. Um, I think I was like I don't know, fourteen, or, and then or what? Fourteen away. Oh snap! Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, um, I remember him as being Nicolas Cage because they do kind of look similar, but um, no, John Cusack did play this role really well, and I think that Cage might have just taken it a bit over the top. Uh, when he starts to figure out that the room is becoming sinister and that the room does have evil intentions, that's when the clock starts to count down, and this is, I think, the creepiest scene in the whole movie. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
just there's something about a clock counting down that is just inherently eerie. It kind of reminds me of like an execution when the clock hits zero and then the inmate starts to get the the drug that's, that's going to kill him. Did. Yeah. 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 And after that, um, he sees the TV go blurry, and he notices an old home movie where you see him, his wife, and his daughter. And at this point in the movie, you don't really know anything about their backstory. And it's worth mentioning that the short story doesn't have any of this. You don't find out about his family. He doesn't have a daughter. He is just some guy who writes horror stories, and he ends up in this hotel room. And in the movie, and they talk about this in the book as well, the hotel room was first rented out to a sewing machine salesman who committed suicide while in the room. And... In the short story, he's also rescued in the end by the sewing machine salesman, so the whole thing comes full circle. And there's a few different interpretations of the story. Like, one theory says that it's just him going through the five stages of grief. He lost his daughter to an unnamed illness, and that's kind of what caused him to no longer believe in anything, and to doubt the existence of God, or to be angry at God. And he became alienated from his wife because I think she reminded him too much of his daughter, and he just walked out on her without any kind of explanation. On the topic of family, there's also one point at the book signing where he's talking to one of his fans who brings him a book that isn't a horror story, it's one that was actually sincerely written. She asks if the narrative about the father and son was true, and he just kind of brushes it off and says, no, it's not real. But then we see a vision of his father in the hotel room. As you were, I was. As I am. What do you find was the scariest part of the whole movie? Um, it does the jump scares pretty well. Uh, pretty creatively, I would say. Um, scary part for me was the guy in the vents. So, well, just a guy in a vent. <laughs> yeah, it was justification for his paranoia. Maybe, yeah. Whatever it was. Yeah. yeah. I'm not really sure how this whole floor works because when you're talking to the manager, like when Samuel L. Jackson is talking, he kind of makes it sound like the whole floor is haunted and that he's hesitant to let anyone stay on that floor. But in the lobby, and then later on on the same floor, you see a woman dressed in white pushing an old-fashioned baby carriage. And she stays in the room next to Mike. And then while he's up in the vent, he looks down and realizes his wife, or a younger version of her, with her daughter Katie. And it's kind of replaying an old memory. And that's the main thing that the room does. One of the funnier scenes, and there are quite a lot of funny scenes. So my favorite scene is when Mike Enslin's talking into the fridge um, with all the, the fixings of the fridge uh, in a hotel. And um, Samuel Jackson's on the other side, baiting him into, and, and you know, toying with him uh, into saying like, hey, um, you deserve this somehow, you're reaping what you sow in this terrible room. And, and this is kind of where the theory that the hotel manager is really the devil comes in, because he says things like, How many spirits have you broken? So much pain. What do you want from me? There's an amazing scene that speaks to the hilarity of, of Cusack as well, where he is shouting into a fridge, uh, you know, what do you want from me? <laughs> over and over, and I love it. It's, yeah. It's good. And then, you know, there's a scene of that with the illusion and without, and it just makes the audience laugh. And it's great for the audience because it it takes your mind out of the, whole, of the element, right? It brings you into comedy, like, all the time. So, yeah. Um, and that's that's the cool thing about this movie is that it bounces around. It bounces into emotion. It bounces out of emotion. It bounces into comedy. Um, it goes into like a lull, a quiet state, and, and you really kind of feel the time that the that the that the clock is you know ticking down. You feel that time when you're watching the movie, but it does. But the movie's not long, so no. whatever they're doing. They're maximizing the, the, the frames on the screen really well. And the directors and, and the actors are, are mindful of everything that the audience is seeing, of course, as you would in any production. But this one, I would say, in quite particular attention. Yeah, that's a really good point. And you do feel a lot of the tension. Like, you do almost feel it in real time. One yeah, of my favorite yeah, scenes yeah. was, and this is more than one scene, actually, but... 
there's one point when he, he's looking at a painting of a ship, of a ship at sea, and then the, the painting comes to life and the water just pours out and he's drowning in the ocean. And this is a callback to an earlier scene when he was out surfing and he wakes up on the shore. But in this part, he wakes up on the shore and he's looking up at a plane and the plane has a banner that has a number on it, which includes the digits 1408. And then he wakes up in the hospital after passing out again. And he's, he sees his wife and she says, oh, you're in LA. It's kind of a play on the, it was all a dream um, tactic that some stories use, but we don't know how long this goes on for. We assume that he reconciles with his wife and that he finishes his manuscript and writes about the room. But strange things keep happening. And when he finally takes in his manuscript to the post office and all the workers in the post office turn around, there's a clock on the wall and they start banging down the walls and he realizes he's still in the room. And it's such a powerful scene. Then you hear him immediately scream, I was out, I was out. And then he's just, his desperation is palpable. Yeah, so there is one theory that this movie is about going through the seven circles of hell. So the first one would be purgatory. I think it's supposed to be after he wakes up on the beach the first time and when he's going to the hotel and things are sort of normal, but sort of not. And then there's lust. I don't know if he would say that he's guilty of lust. He doesn't really show too much of that. Although there's one scene where he's talking to one of his fans and they're kind of flirting. And then when he first enters the hotel room, he's, look, he's about to look at porn, but he doesn't. So I don't know if that really counts. But... The only sins I could say that he's really guilty of would be gluttony, because he's an alcoholic, um, screaming, I want my drink. Yeah, because after he says, what do you want from me? Like, he closes the fridge, because he doesn't see the, the beer, even though it's there. But he just says, I want my drink. You don't remember that? I don't remember that. It does happen. Okay. I promise. And then the final circle of hell would be treachery. So that's when he sees his daughter, because he has to face the fact that he betrayed his wife and he left her after the daughter's death. And this reminds me a lot of this other scene from Game of Thrones. Where Daenerys Targaryen sees her husband who was killed in battle and her son who was stillborn. And even though she knows it's not real, it's still absolutely gut-wrenching to watch. And, and then in this scene as well, he knows his daughter isn't real. He knows it's just part of the room, but he can't help himself. No, you're not Katie. I need help. Please. You're not real. Yeah, the directors um, play a lot on, I would say, the, the audio of the movie very well, because in that particular scene, it's dead silent. Um, there's nothing going on except for his daughter speaking and, and him sobbing and um, they play with the white noise of the movie very well. A lot of things will happen and then he'll be, you know, on the ground and, you know, freezing and stuff and and then the, the cadence of the audio flows in and out of the movie very well to the point that um, it's able to carry the, the audience's attention. Where it's demanding uh, emotion and stuff. So yeah, um, again, uh, very well done. Like, for what it is, I think it's like a masterful movie. And I can yeah. certainly see why there's a cult following. For sure. Yeah, and it came out in 2007, which was... I'm pretty sure that was before Deepfakes. But one of my other favorite scenes is right before he sees his daughter, after he returns to the room or realizes he's still in the room. And then, despite what Olin says earlier about electronics not working in the room, he is able to use his laptop. Because I think that the rules of the room are that if the electricity or if the electronics serve the room's purpose, then they're able to work. Because well, TV also works too. So he's able to use his laptop and he contacts his wife, who is completely flabbergasted that he calls her after all this time. And he says like, I'm in this room, I'm in trouble, I need the cops. So she sends the cops over and then a few minutes later says, they're in 1408 and there's nobody there. This room functions in its own reality. Um, there's also another scene where uh, he tries to escape by walking onto the ledge, and then he comes back and looks at the fire escape map, and the room is isolated with nothing else around it. 
But when he gets a call back from his wife, there's an alternate version of himself showing up on the screen, completely deep fake style. And it's scary now because I feel like that could happen in real life. Don't, like, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, what's going on now? Yep, so it's this electronic version of himself telling his wife to come directly to the hotel, and uh, Enslin at the same time is screaming, No, no, that's not me! Like, don't come! So, then the, uh, then the Avatar winks at him, which I think was kind of funny. Um, after the death of his daughter, the clock sets back to zero, so the room goes back to where it was before, and then he gets a call, and he immediately says, Why don't you just kill me? And the voice on the other line says, That's up to you. Would you like to check out Mr. Enslin? Yes. Yeah. It says, would you like to use our express checkout system? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then a news drops down from the ceiling. Different things were happening in the second part. So, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, the way that I saw it, I think watching his daughter die again just broke him. And then he was like, okay, I lived selfishly, but I'm not going to die that way. And then he uses the bottle of scotch, makes a Molotov cocktail, chucks it at the wall, and burns down the room. When the room was getting cut off from the rest of the building, you see a brick wall... Um, in front of the window with the words burn me alive and I thought that was a really good touch and very foreshadowy too. And let's talk about the endings. Uh, the theatrical version shows Enslin living. He goes back to reunite with his wife. It's presumed that she, he tells her everything that happens in 1408 because he brings out the tape recorder at one point and he plays it and then there's his own voice and his daughter's voice and the look on his wife's face is just unreal and the look on his face afterward with this expression of i told you so was Which just is a like, very john cusack face yeah <laughs> yeah it works very well and then there's another version uh the director's cut where insulin dies in the fire and it cuts to his funeral where Holden shows up and he tries to give a box of insulin's belongings to his wife and she decides that she doesn't want them but he's saying it's important that you know that your husband died a hero, that the room won't reopen. And then the publisher, who's also at the funeral, just kind of cuts him off and says, go away. So Olin goes back to his car, plays the tape recorder, hears Enslin's daughter's voice, hears Katie's voice, and then looks in the rearview mirror and sees a charred body in the backseat. Hears a little girl calling for her father, and then he sees them walk off um, into the cemetery. It cuts to Enslin's ghost in the charred remains of 1408, hearing his daughter's voice, walking towards it, and exiting the room forever. So, if you had to choose between those two endings, which one would you pick? I thought the theatrical choice was the good choice. So, yeah, yeah, I would have chosen that one. Though, I do like the idea of both endings being present, because it goes into more depth, and you get to see more of the hotel manager, and, and um, the, the idea that Enslin has given up on Faith, but in the end he's believe he's with his daughter yeah um and so he's kind of coming around to that yeah because the theory that holds that this movie is a reenactment of dante's inferno is that your soul has to be purified before it can go to the afterlife and because he's at the point where he doesn't believe in anything he's treating everyone in his life like shit um this was very clever on hellstrom's part because it's kind of the opposite of what you see in most of king's work um and again this isn't even touched on in the short stories but i think the concept was very true to king where in most cases, he has a character, a protagonist, who is capable of evil, but is outwardly good. But then they end up being overtaken by an evil force. You read about this in It, in The Shining, and several others. But in this case, it's the opposite, because you have a protagonist who's outwardly a complete jerk, but he has good inside of him. And then once he goes through this hell, he's able to be redeemed and either allowed to live, or he dies a hero's death and is reunited with his daughter. So either way, it's a satisfying ending. Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. It's just a fun ride. It's a short, fun ride, an hour, 40 minutes-ish. Um, and it's it's fun being an audience to a director's playful attitude and how they would like to manipulate you throughout their visual experience. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm all for it. It's a, it's a great movie. You should watch it if you haven't watched it. And uh, watch it again because you might <laughs> catch something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for watching, and thanks for being on the show, babe. Of course. Thank you. All right. Stay scared.
I want my drink! <laughs> <laughs>